Looks like we have a great crowd here. So Michael, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for the introduction. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, we're gonna let it run for about another minute or so to let people who are trying to get in, uh, get in and get connected. And then I'll do a brief introduction uh, and at that point, turn things over to our speaker. But for the moment, uh, welcome to everybody who is here. Great to see you uh, at least via Zoom. Uh, appreciate your interest and your time. Uh, and there we are. Okay, the host has spotlighted my video. Isn't that fun? Um, so I actually like to see everybody at the same time. So we're going to go. I'm going to my screen. I'm going to have all the titles show up. Um, Okay, well, there may well be a few people who come in uh, in the next few minutes, but why don't we go ahead and get started in the interest of expediency. Welcome officially uh, to the initial workshop in the fall 20, 2022 edition of the uh, Center for Governance and Markets collaboration with the Future Law Project, both at the University of Pittsburgh uh, series on the future of law, technology, and governance. Uh, I am Mike Madison. I am a professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, and I am today's moderator and host. Uh, I want to make sure I thank the Center for Governance and Markets for providing the technology infrastructure, the marketing infrastructure, uh, some funding, and uh, critically, all of kind of the energy and impetus behind helping to make this series a reality. This is the third semester that we have done this, so I'm very happy to continue the collaboration that we have underway. And in the room, we have Brian Bayer and Kate Bargish from the center uh, helping with support today and going forward. Uh, let me do a very brief introduction uh, of our speaker. I'm super excited uh, to have some of our speakers this fall uh, focus on intersections between business law of different sorts and technology issues of different sorts. Uh, our speaker today is Mikhail Gall, uh, who is a faculty member at the University of Haifa in Israel, where she is the director of the Haifa Center for Law and Technology, which is a very long-standing and very well-known uh, interdisciplinary center on law and technology uh, known around the world. To right now, she is coming to us from New York City, where she is spending the fall semester as a visiting professor at the NYU School of Law. Uh, she is also currently the president of the International Association of Competition Law Scholars, which you can see on her title slide. Uh, she is going to talk to us about uh, algorithmic cartels, which is based on a forthcoming paper uh, and ongoing work. Uh, she's going to give a talk that will last until, give or take, half past the hour. And at that point, uh, we'll uh, have a moderated Q&A. Uh, I, will, I will do most of the moderating. Uh, but we we'll, should have plenty of time for our questions and discussions at that point. So, Mikhail, welcome. Thank you for being with us. And I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much. And I'm excited uh, to be here. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. And I'm, I'm especially excited to talk about algorithmic cartels because uh, the way that I see it, it's one of our next frontiers in regulation of joint activity. And it has effects on each and every one of us. And not, and, and even more so, the past two years have been formative because now we have evidence, and I will talk about it in a second, uh, which is not only theoretical, but also experimental, that uh, our algorithms, pricing algorithms, can then coordinate and increase prices to super competitive levels, which means that if this happens, or where this happens, and when this happens, uh, we all have to pay higher prices. So uh, um, the, the structure of the lecture uh, today is going to have three parts. The first part, I would like to talk about what we now know about algorithm price uh, coordination. Then I will ask, can this kind of conduct be captured under our existing laws? And the third one would be, what can be done? Okay, if there's anything that we can do in order to limit such algorithmic coordination. 
So let me start with some statistics because these statistics actually show you some of the trends that we may might not all be aware of, but are important to understand why the subject that I'm talking about has effects on each and every one of us. So more than 50% of US retailers use pricing algorithms. Okay, these are algorithms that assist them in determining which price they should set in the market. Okay, 67% of, uh, of EU firms who tracked their competitors on a daily basis did so by using algorithms. And 35% of such firms also used automatic pricing algorithms in order to then use the information uh, have feed it into the algorithm so that the algorithm will set the price. And we also uh, see many uh, 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 researchers uh, um, that note frequent use of pricing algorithms uh, in many industries, for example, online retail and tourism and petrol uh, stations. And if you want, we can talk later about why in these industries uh, and um, which industries are more prone to it. So the first question I would like to put is, can algorithms learn to facilitate coordination? And here I'm aided by the wonderful work of uh, Ariel Zrahi and Maurice Stucky, who have uh, uh, written a wonderful book called Methods of Digitized Coordination. Okay, And they point to four types of activities in which algorithms can be used, can potentially be used in order to um, uh, facilitate a coordination, okay? So one of them is uh, for algorithms to be used in uh, uh, traditional collusion. So this situation is the easiest one in the sense that what we're talking about here are, are, is, is a situation where humans have decided okay that they would like to engage in coordinated conduct they would like to enter let's say a cartel and they use an algorithm to facilitate it but an existed an agreement sorry in the traditional sense exists here and one example is a case called Topkin's case. This was a case that was brought in the US and also in uh, the UK. Um, and um, um, uh, uh, several firms who sold online posters decided that they would like uh, to coordinate the prices of posters. They had such an agreement. And in order to put it in place, because prices were constantly changing, they uh, used algorithms. Okay, so this is the easiest case. The more difficult case uh, is what we call hub and spoke case. And these are more complicated scenarios which arise when competitors deliberately use a joint algorithmic price setter. Okay, you might think about it as a mediator algorithm, which is designed to maximize the profits of its users. Okay. And whether or not such cases are, uh, are legal or not, it's not always straightforward. It depends on what is included in the algorithm, who uses it, uh, um, uh, what they know about the decision-making, et cetera, okay? We had several cases like this around the world. It's gaining more and more interest. Uh, um, a very famous case is a tourist case. It's a European case. What happened there is you had uh, uh, a system that managed uh, 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 vacations and travel. And uh, many firms in uh, uh, Latvia were using the same system, okay, in order to get their information about the, the, the different uh, prices of the, um, of the uh, um, uh, hotels and the, uh, air, um, and the uh, air travel, etc. cetera. And um, at some point, uh, the the firm that was operating the algorithm sent everybody a, an email saying, from now on, you are not, uh, um, you would not be able to reduce the price by more than 3%. Okay. 
okay, and this went all the way to the European Supreme Court, and the European Supreme Court said this might be well, might well be an agreement because you have here a facilitator of an agreement, okay. Uh, however, uh, you should also prove that the travel agencies knew about it, okay. So they had to you had to prove that they actually read the email and were aware of this limitation, which was imposed from above. The third case is even uh, uh, more complicated and more challenging. And this happens when algorithms are designed um, independently by competitors to include decisional parameters that react to other competitors' decisions in a way which you can know strengthens or maintains a joint coordinated uh, outcome. So let me give you a very simple example. This is a leader follower algorithm. Okay, so you have one firm setting using an algorithm to set the price, and the other one using an algorithm which uh, uh, is is coded such that um, um, uh, look look at, um, for the price of my competitor and and uh, my price should always be equal to the price of my competitor. Okay, this is a very simple form of leader follower. Okay, um, I'm not going to get into the intricacies of this, but there is a question of whether or not this is illegal or not. The uh, uh, most uh, uh, um, difficult case, and this is the one I'm going to focus mostly on, is the fourth one. And this is a case that involves unsupervised learned uh, coordination, okay? This creates the real challenge. And this kind of cases are ones in which the algorithms are not deliberately designed in a way which facilitates coordination. Rather, the algorithm is giving a, is given a general goal such as maximize profits, and it auto autonomously determines the decisional parameters that it can use. And then the question is, if the algorithm learns to coordinate autonomously, okay, without any human, uh, uh, you know, um, um, assisting such coordination, is that going to be legal or not? And uh, can uh, algorithms actually reach this? Uh, um, uh, state. So if you want this graphically, you can think about this last case, the most difficult one, as the black box, okay? You use, the firm has all kinds of inputs. It, uh, uh, inputs might be prices in the market and the cost of uh, production. And the algorithm is, is told, maximize prices under uh, 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 these conditions and the algorithm determines the price. And the question is, would collusion result? And the answer, unfortunately, is yes. Under some market conditions, coordination, price coordination will result. And the OECD said that as early as 2017. Let me read to you part of their long and good report. They said, by providing companies with powerful automated mechanisms to monitor prices, implement common policies, send market signals, or optimize joint profits with deep learning techniques, algorithms might enable firms to achieve the same outcome of traditional hardcore cartels through tacit collusion. Okay, so this was a theoretical answer that was given at the time. And to, to see why, or uh, um, to understand, you know, what happens here? Why uh, um, uh, we think that algorithms might learn to uh, uh, coordinate? I think it's very. Um, I, I mean, I think a good way to think about it is to go back to uh, the work of uh, 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 Steve, uh, 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 sorry, George Stigler, who it, who um, was a Nobel laureate in uh, uh, economics, and he pointed to three conditions for coordination. He said, if firms would like to coordinate okay, prices, let's say in the market, there are three conditions that need to exist. The first 
is they have to reach an understanding, some kind of agreement on what trade conditions uh, will be profitable for all the parties to the agreement. Okay, so these might be uh, uh, this might be an agreement on price, on quantity, on quality. Okay, it means dissolving this any disagreements into uh, as regards the correct terms uh, that all parties uh, perceived as beneficial relative to a situation in which they do not coordinate. Okay, this is the first. The second is detection. Okay, you have to detect deviations from this supra competitive equilibrium. Okay, uh, so the slower and less complete deviations are detected, the weaker the coordination. Why? Because then firms have stronger incentives to cheat. Because let's assume that our super competitive price is a pen. But the cost of production is five. So if I can cheat on that, I can sell at nine and a half and still be highly profitable and sell more units than my competitors. The third <coughs> uh, um, condition here is creating a credible threat of retaliation in order to discourage deviations, because even if you find the deviation, you need to discourage it, discourage it through a sanction for uh, this not to take place, okay? Um, another condition for uh, coordination is the market should be characterized by high entry barriers. Stigler just assumed that he did not say it uh, directly. And we also have a lot of learning about market conditions that assist coordination. Okay, I said I'm going to leave uh, uh, aside uh, for now. If anybody's interested, I have an article on that. It's called uh, Algorithms as Illegal Agreements. It came out in the Berkeley Journal of uh, Law and Technology, I think three years ago or so. Okay, so let's take these uh, uh, conditions that Stigler was uh, talking about and very, very briefly. I want to show you how the fact that we're using a price algorithm might affect each and every one of them in a way which increases coordination. Okay, so reaching an agreement. Here I'm going to put a few things uh, um, um, on the board. So the first is that they can uh, uh, um, um, they can engage in speedier uh, calculation of the um, um, profit maximizing price. They can engage in a more sophisticated calculation very fast. They make rational decision. And uh, uh, I think that the most important part here, or at least I think it's the most important part, is that algorithms are what um, uh, is, uh, they are what you might call recipes for action. Okay. So that um, if you see the algorithm, you can actually, in a way, read its mind. Okay, I mean, uh, what do I mean see? I mean, if a computer scientist see an, uh, sees an algorithm, he would know if you give it a certain input, what the output would be. Okay, so uh, under different market conditions. So once the algorithm is transparent, and this is a, a point which is very important, and we'll get uh, to it uh, um, more um, in, in a bit, this by itself might strengthen uh, the ability to uh, reach an agreement. How about detection? Algorithms can assist us in monitoring the market, in distinguishing between different situations which led to deviations, and they reduce incentives to deviate. And also with regard to sanctions, they are able to react immediately to a price. So think about, you know, I think this is one of the most obvious examples here or more, uh, is online retail, where you have many competitors and uh, you want to distinguish yourself uh, via price. Okay, so the price right now is 10 and you want to reduce it to 9.5. If all your competitors, if you know that all your competitors can immediately detect your price change, and immediately react by lowering their own price, you would not change it in the first place. Algorithms are also better at calculating risk. It's not that we do not know how to calculate risk. It just takes more effort, more time, sometimes 
you know, it does, it's not worth our effort to do so. And for different reasons, they can also create a more credible threat of sanction. Okay. And again, high entry barriers must exist. This is the only condition that algorithms cannot affect. So for many years, we had, or many, <laughs> this is all very new. I mean, but for, I don't know, uh, for the, the four years or so, we had a lot of theoretical uh, arguments on why algorithms uh, might be better at coordination. What we now have, and this is new, this is from you know the last two years or so, they uh, are experiments, okay? So what researchers have shown in one study after the other is that algorithms learned through experimentation to shift from competitive pricing rules to collusive ones and sustain a new super competitive equilibrium above price. And the most interesting and the first study on this subject was a study by Calvano et al. It's called Artificial Intelligence, Algorithmic Pricing and Collusion. It came out in Science Magazine. It's so important. And what they did there is they used two um, machine learning algorithms. They're called Q-learning. That's a, a, a type of machine learning algorithms, pricing algorithms, and they um, uh, let them decide, determine prices in an ongoing game in which they had information about market conditions in real markets, okay? And what they have shown is that tacit collusion uh, and super competitive prices emerge in more than 60% of the cases. Okay, um, and if you had sufficient simulation, it arose in even a higher percentage of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, cases. And results were observed in significantly rich environments with up to a hundred uh, different uh, price levels. And this is a quote that I took from them. Okay, what they say is this: What is most worrying is that the algorithms leave no trace of concerted action. They learn to collude purely by trial and error with no prior knowledge of the environment in which they operate without communicating with one another and without being specifically designed or instructed to collude, okay? As I said, we have other studies. Um, I don't expect you to you know, read this slide, but I do want to uh, focus on one of the studies here, which is a study by Assad et al. It's the third one, okay? What they did, okay, this is a study of a real market in which algorithms were used. So it's uh, a set to um, uh, determine the impact on German gasoline prices of a sale of AI powered uh, uh, pricing algorithms to a multitude of gas stations. Um, so what they checked is, uh, let's say markets in which you had two gas stations and both of them, or one of them was using an algorithm. So what they have shown is that when one of them was using a pricing algorithm, the price in the market did not change too much. When both of them were using a pricing algorithm, the prices rose by uh, uh, um, a margin of uh, um, up to um, 27%, from 9 to 27%. That's huge, right? And uh, just imagine these price increases over many markets, okay? So this has shown that this is a real problem. So the bottom line here is that today we know that algorithms can help facilitate coordination under some market conditions. And then my last question is what can be done? What are the remedies for algorithmic coordination? Okay, so as I said, you know, the most difficult case and that's the one that I'm going to focus on is unsupervised learned coordination, okay? The case of an algorithm learning by itself that coordination is the best way to go to maximize profit. So 
Um, I assume that not many of you know antitrust laws. Just let me give you a, a flavor of it. Under, uh, um, um, uh, under antitrust law, a collusive agreement is illegal, but oligopolistic coordination, that is coordination that is autonomous uh, 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 decisions that lead to coordination, that is legal. And this is because the law prohibits agreements in restraint of trade. So what is an agreement? A bit from the case law, okay? It, might, it must involve either express or implicit formulation, uh, 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 let's say a meeting of minds. It requires some form of communication between competitors, which signals intent to act in a coordinated way and their reliance on each other to follow suit. And the mode of communication is also often important. And uh, uh, at the same time, mirroring interdependent conduct in which the competitors act unilaterally while they take into account the probable reaction of the rivals, this does not constitute agreement. So let's apply it to algorithms, okay? First of all, the fact that coordination is achieved through algorithmic interactions does not prevent proof of an agreement Okay, so that by itself is not an obstacle. How about intent? If we require intent for an, a, a, a cartel, an, a, 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 such an agreement. Um, so you might say that algorithms intend to achieve certain goals. And also you might say that the, the, that the designer of the algorithm intends to create coordination. And you might say that the user intends to employ such an algorithm. So that also might not be a barrier, a legal barrier that is problematic. How about communication? Communication is, uh, uh, um, uh, you might say that communicating through the decisional parameters coded in the algorithm and set by them, you might say it's enough. Is it enough? Probably not. So algorithms, uh, uh, as such coordination by algorithms is uh, 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 most likely in most cases not cut under our laws. Unless, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, the, I should say that the, um, uh, uh, the um, it, in some situations, uh, um, it might be caught. These are very, very limited situations in which you might have what we call facilitating practices or plus factors. So what do I mean here? These are situations in which we have avoidable practices that make it easier to coordinate without upsetting benefits to consumers. Okay? And in such situations, if you can prove that this is the case, that then this by itself will come under the legal prohibition and be illegal. So when might that happen? When, for example, a company makes its algorithm transparent to its rival and consumers do not benefit from it. Or when companies share data, the same data, so the, their algorithms can learn the same things from the data. Or they use the same data pool, which might be an inefficient data pool. All of these are practices that facilitate coordination. And as long as they do not, um, uh, they do not uh, um, uh, further consumer uh, welfare, um, um, offsetting consumer, uh, they do not have offsetting consumer welfare benefits, they would be prohibited. So under our bottom line, under our current laws, algorithmic coordination is not captured. Some suggested solutions, so some suggested solutions, I, I see what, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're at the half hour, so let me just go through this slide. And then I will tell you a bit more and we can talk more 
uh, and uh, I, I can tell you more if there's time in the Q and A if you'd like about other solutions. So these are suggested solutions that were made uh, within the law, okay, without changing the law. They do not require change of the law. Some talk about algorithmic transparency and explainability. So they require that the algorithms be transparent and they be explainable so that uh, we can find out more about how the algorithms operate. However, this involves costs, especially explainability, because machine learning is not always ex easily explainable. And second, we just said before that transparency might strengthen coordination of algorithms, right? If you know what the algorithms of your rivals are doing, this might strengthen coordination. So this by itself might be problematic. Another uh, 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 suggestion which was made is to create a toolbox for detection, okay? And to have what is called intervention triggers so you uh, automatically monitor anomalies in the market. And if you see an anomaly with regard to you know, a, a high coordinated price, then uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you um, uh, can apply the law, okay? But again, the problem is that if it's not captured within the law, then even if you know that the algorithm is coordinating, you can't do anything about it. Right? What can happen, but that's only in Europe, not in the US, is if you um, determine that the algorithms are operating as a joint monopoly under European competition law, you can then regulate them as excessive prices, okay? Because they are. Uh, leading to super competitive prices. And in Europe, that is prohibited, but that is not prohibited in the US. Okay, so I'll stop here. There are other remedies. I'm actually suggesting some other remedies in my own paper, but I want to take your questions. And if I have time, I will gladly talk about them. Okay, so let me stop my, sharing my screen. All right, thank you, Mikhail. Thank you very much. So super provocative, interesting talk. So uh, I have questions, but let me defer to any of you who want to raise your hand in Zoom or type something in the chat uh, that I could read out or just wave at the screen uh, if you would like to offer a, a question or a comment. Anyone? Ah, Peter. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing okay. So um, uh, I'll just disclose, uh, I, I teach antitrust here at Pitt. Um, so I know a little bit about what the, the law is uh, in this particular area. And um, what I found most interesting, I mean, many, I, I know nothing about algorithms, technology. Uh, I'm a Luddite um, and, and somewhat proud of it, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I will, uh, so I'm not familiar with all the different cases that you had mentioned uh, in, in a really fantastic talk. Um, but the thing that what I find most interesting is this, uh, one of the cases or scenarios that you did not focus um, so much on, um, but it's the hub and spoke situation involving the, uh, the taxi cab company uh, in Luxembourg. And right. I do know a little bit about that, that case, um, which is interesting for a number of different reasons um, in that, uh, first of all, um, so under American antitrust law, um, the Luxembourg authorities essentially applied what can be understood as a rule of reason analysis. And I thought what was interesting was, first of all, that they ultimately concluded that um, the use of the algorithm was actually beneficial from a competitive mm -hmm. standpoint, right? right. Um, so uh, because as I understand it, um, they found that the use of this um, uh, algorithm or platform essentially to calculate different types of taxi rates um, by different cab drivers ended up actually resulting in efficiencies 
in the sense that it was better not only for the company itself because it resulted in less empty taxi cabs, but it ultimately ended up actually being better for the environment because it actually reduced pollution. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting just because it, it kind of speaks to the fact, I think, that you alluded to, which is that algorithms certainly can have pro-competitive effects if they're actually used properly. Um, uh, but we have to be careful about how we actually go about them. My question is actually more about this issue about agreement. And um, so, uh, so let's just take an example like Uber in which we're thinking about a company in which we have outside of California, um, taxi cab drivers or Uber drivers who are all independent contractors. Right. Okay. And they're all using the same actual uh, program for determining who needs an actual ride under Uber and what the price in fact will actually be to be charged at that particular time, right, um, for the service that's being offered. So you have multiple independent individuals who are all utilizing the same actual platform and same algorithm, okay? And the question then is for me is, does that actually constitute an agreement? Because, uh, so to be much more precise, the question I wanna ask here is, are you suggesting or indicating that um, coordinated use by each of these Uber drivers of the same actual platform, and maybe just off conversations by them saying, look, um, hey, I just found out that actually um, driving on a Thursday night actually maximizes your return, and they share that with other Uber drivers um, by calling or texting them. Does that constitute the kind of coordinated conduct that would arise to the level of being an agreement that satisfies the collusion, uh, the, the claim of collusion under American antitrust law. Right. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you. I um, uh, thank you for this. Uh, these two um, um, uh, questions here. And um, uh, let me start with the. Um, I mean, both of, of the cases that you mentioned, of course have to do with uh, the same market structure and uh, even the same market, the market for taxis. And uh, I think that uh, the European decision uh, about the Luxembourg uh, taxi is actually um, a decision from Luxembourg. It's not a decision of the EU uh, uh, court. I'm not even sure that the EU court would have decided it in the same way. I think, uh, I mean, you got it completely right. I think that I would, um, I would highlight here two points. The first is how, how did you delve into the economic effect? Because it might be that an algorithm increases efficiency overall. So it's better with the algorithm than without the algorithm. And I think this is what the court is saying. But another question is, would, uh, would there have, uh, I mean, do you, can you think about a situation in which you can use an algorithm, but with, without some of the conditions that their algorithm had? So you would reduce uh, uh, um, uh, res uh, restraints, specific restraints. And I, I think that the court in Luxembourg did not look at that. And I think that US courts would have looked at that because of the, it needs to be necessary, ancillary, but necessary in order to achieve uh, uh, the specific goal. The second uh, interesting uh, uh, part, which you alluded to so correctly, has to do with uh, reduced pollution, okay? I mean, how wide do you, can, should you use, or are you allowed to use competition law in order to uh, incorporate public uh, um, benefits that are not specifically related to competition. Okay, so I think that it's a very interesting case uh, uh, there. Um, but I'm not sure. I think that in the U.S. it might have been decided a bit different. Again, depending on the effect. Now, with regard to Uber, Uber is, I think, a fascinating question, and it's a question that has come. Uh, in front of courts. I mean, courts are deciding such questions around the world. And I just want to say three very short things. First of all, the coordination by drivers that you um, um, uh, uh, were um, uh, referring to, that by itself, I think, definitely comes under agreement. Okay? It's an agreement that actually takes advantage 
of some of their learning with regard to the algorithm. So they learn that the algorithm operates in a certain way. So there have been studies that have shown that when the number of drivers goes down, of course, you know, the price goes up because then supply goes down and the demand might stay the same. So what they, they what some drivers in some countries have been doing is that they have been coordinating when to get off the system so that their, uh, their co-workers can then enjoy higher prices. That by itself, definitely an agreement, I think. Uh, it's a straightforward case. Is the use of the same algorithm uh, uh, um, by different taxi drivers, is this by itself an agreement? Um, I think that the answer here might be no, but again, it depends on you know, what the agreement states. It, of course, the, the answer is not trivial here because we're not talking about workers. Okay? If they were workers, it would have been different because it would have been within the same firm. And finally, there is a very interesting study by uh, Thomas Cheng um, uh, uh, about predation, the predation of Uber, using the algorithm in order to predate against competitors. So what it found is that it found which drivers were driving less on its system. And it used the algorithms in order to give these drivers better offers and better prices. Okay, so on the margin, okay, you um, capture those drivers who are trying to work with another company, or you're assuming that they're trying to work with a competitor, and you're using predation in order to it's um, uh, in order to um, uh, um, bring them back into the system. So hope I answered. <laughs> okay, uh, I have a question, but I will again, hold back if other ones, somebody else would like to go next. Okay, well, hearing none, I'm gonna leap right in because my question sort of builds on Peter's in part or it's sort of in the same spirit. And so let me, let me have a comment, then a question. Not uh, not a question in the form of a comment. So the comment is that uh, a lot of the sort of description of the phenomena that you you reviewed, you know, algorithms, yes, but algorithms building on shared data or pooled data. Mm -hmm. um, and so the the observation or the comment is that you know this is a version in a sense of the knowledge commons phenomena that i've started to i've been studying for a long time and with kathy as you know um you know in in our knowledge commons world you know we generally look at uh sort of knowledge sharing or information pooling or data pools as kind of neutral things to start with but with likely uh, sort of innovative potential or productive potential or socially beneficial potential associated with them. We have always known that cartels are the obvious example of harmful uh, information pooling or data pooling. And, and so the, you know, the suggestion is that the work that you've described, the work that you're doing might be a really interesting opportunity to do some case study application of our knowledge commons framework to show the contrast between harmful data pooling and productive data pooling. Uh, so like the, the example that Peter gave of the sort of the environmental benefits of uh, what otherwise looks like a collusive arrangement is so sort of, yes, it expands the domain of relevant public policy issues beyond what has been conventionally been done in antitrust law, but the knowledge commons environment shows you that that's kind of an elastic boundary from a conceptual standpoint, not from a doctrinal standpoint. So that, that's kind of the observation of the comment. Like this is really interesting to me because I see how information sharing as a phenomenon is really what's going on underneath the, the specifics of a particular business or firm or sector. Here's the question. Uh, and again, it kind of relates to what Peter was asking. So my antitrust knowledge is a little antiquated. So uh, I, you know, I read George Stigler when I was in law school. That was the, mm -hmm. the first thing I was told to do. Uh, and so I kind of remember my Stigler uh, and the kind of the basic instinct. And the basic instinct is that collusion as to price 
or agreements as to price among competitors are per se illegal and other kinds of agreements are subject to a rule of reason. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the, in both instances, uh, so the real question is market impacts, right? So, so what are, what's the effect of the behavior, whether it's, whether it's agreement as to this or agreements as to that, what is the ultimate effect in the marketplace? Um, it, so here's what's interesting about your summary of what's going on with the algorithmic technologies is that the question of, as you went through in detail, the question of what counts as an agreement in an algorithmic context has gotten much more complicated, right? Right, because firms are one or two or three steps removed from the actual affirmative steps of expressing and communicating assent to what other somebody else is doing. Uh, instead, what you have is a kind of probabilistic inquiry, right? What's the likely impact of having adopted certain technologies in certain market conditions? Um, that to me sounds kind of tort-like. It sounds like approximate cause kind of a question, right? Did the firm do something that led to this other thing that led to this ultimate harm, um, which has a kind of rule of reason flavor to it because it's a very standards oriented question as opposed to the kind of rule oriented question of whether there's an agreement, but it, it takes a rule of reason approach, but in a different part of the market, it's a rule of reason approach to the initial choice to adopt the technology rather than a rule of reason approach to what's the impact of the technology in the marketplace. So, so the, I guess the question that comes through, through that little intro is, you know, is the, is the historical emphasis on agreements in antitrust law, kind of out of date, right? So your, your, your last slide, you're like, what can we do? You know, we can tweak the evidentiary standards for what counts as an agreement. We can be more transparent about algorithms. It kind of hints at maybe we're just asking the wrong question. Maybe antitrust has kind of run out of ideas in terms of its doctrinal structure because it has been so focused on agreements. Maybe antitrust law should be more focused on Sort of probabilistic determinations, more of a tort style analysis at the front end of firm behavior rather than only at the impact end of firm behavior. So, Mike, I guess it's like, am I on to something? Am I nuts? Uh, what do you think? Well, again, thank you. These are two wonderful uh, comments and a question. Let me uh, very briefly uh, relate to the, the, the comment. I agree with you uh, definitely that knowledge commons can go, uh, um, you know, that they might be extremely helpful, but they might also be used as a basis for coordinated um, um, conduct. Um, a question to ask in this regard is, can we differentiate before, ahead of time, which cases which will lead to market coordination and higher prices and harm consumers in which cases are going to lead to other effects. Okay, I think that would be uh, an interesting question to, to, to think about in this regard. Okay, so now with regard to your, your uh, second question, um, uh, uh, some research ha researchers have gone exactly the way that you have gone. Okay, so the, the, I think that there's quite a lot of agreement between those writing in this space, even the, 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 the legal uh, scholars, that the, um, our, our laws are outdated. They are based on assumptions about how markets work that relate to humans rather than to algorithms. So once you introduce algorithms and we saw that many firms are now using algorithms. So once you go back to this statistic, okay, and you see that, you know, what might happen with these algorithms, again, the focus on agreement is not going to capture many of these instances. So let me just uh, uh, show you, I, I'm gonna share again, you know, uh, um, a few slides if that's okay. Can you see that? Yeah, okay, good. So this is uh, what we've seen, right? Uh, but there's also, uh, and Michael, this, is, this goes 
exactly, and this is exactly in line with what you have suggested. There are some researchers who have suggested changing the law, what you might call competition by design. And what they say is that we should no longer focus on the agreement. Rather, we should focus on the conduct or on the outcome. Okay, if this is harmful, and harmful algorithm, we should not allow this algorithm to be used. And what has changed here, okay? Why should we uh, uh, um, um, do that, okay? What they point to is that we can actually read the mind of the algorithm if it is transparent, or once we see several instances in which the algorithm makes decisions based on different market conditions, okay? so. What they do is they compare, this is all from the science article that I, uh, um, I, I mentioned before. So they compare humans and algorithms. They say that whereas in humans, you have some kind of communication of an agreement, in algorithms, it might not even be present. Okay? They don't need to communicate with each other uh, to uh, set such prices. Uh, with regard to the collusive pricing rules in humans, it, it is latent and not discoverable because, you know, it's in our minds and nobody can read our minds. Whereas with regard to algorithms, it's discoverable because these are the, the that's the code, okay? That's part of the decision-making process of the algorithm, okay? So what we are saying is that with regard to uh, um, algorithms, what we need to capture are those algorithmic rules or parts of the code which lead to collusion, lead to coordination. Now, this kind of remedy has a lot of benefits. It goes to the roots of coordination, okay? The algorithm that uh, determines the coordination itself. It aligns with experimental findings that if we change the algorithm, it might change you know, the, the price set in the market. It may be applied ex ante, competition by design, okay? Um, and, and this, Michael, uh, alludes to, to your good point about initial choice of what to adopt, okay? So this is all here. However, it has potential problems, okay? And, um, and so uh, uh, let me just go very quickly through three of them. First of all, and this is, by the way, if you want to read more, uh, and this is in my recent paper, uh, Limiting Algorithmic Cartels, uh, you can find both of them on SSRN if anybody's interested. So um, uh, let me go very quickly through three potential problems that might exist here. The first is legal limitations, okay? The, the, the law in the U.S. does not capture uh, uh, the conduct, it captures the agreement that leads to the conduct, okay? So we need a change, but okay, this is something that maybe, you know, we can do. Another more serious problem here is identifying the pricing rules that create coordination. What exactly are we going to prohibit here? And can we really create ex ante and uh, initial uh, uh, certainty via lab test? Okay, before these are used in the market, so that uh, firms will know uh, uh, what kind of rules are allowed and what kind of rules are not allowed. Um, and uh, um, let me give you just another flavor of why this is problematic, because under which market conditions are you going to test the algorithm to determine whether the firm can use it or not? What is going to be the number of firms? What is going to be the homogeneity of the product? You, you make certain assumptions, but it might be that it eventually would operate under different market assumptions. Okay, so you do not want to prohibit more than is necessary, and that by itself might be problematic. And the last one, which I think is the most problematic, and this is based on, you know, I had uh, talks with numerous economists uh, IO economist. Uh, the problem here is which information should be ignored by the algorithm? Okay. Um, and so are we, uh, are we um, 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 saying to the algorithm or to the firm, uh, the algorithm should uh, ignore price signals in the market? Should it ignore 
rival prices in the market. And if, an, if we do that, how would it affect innovation? Because our whole system of competition and our whole models are based on, on reaction to the conditions in the market. And if we take this away, we are actually engaging in price regulation because we're saying to the firm, maybe do not use signals in the market, do not take into account the prices of your rivals, only take into account your own costs. But this is direct price regulation. Uh, so that's really interesting. I guess my, my only reaction, which is to that really thoughtful um, summary is, um, you know, we're always in the business of model building and model regulating, right? Uh, I mean, so Stigler and, you know, price theory gives us a model of market competition based on price. Antitrust law and classic competition law generally work off of other sometimes explicit models, sometimes implicit models. Uh, we're always tinkering with models, even if we're not always aware that we're tinkering with models. Um, maybe the real takeaway from your point about algorithms is all of a sudden this tinkering with models business becomes front and center in yeah. a way that for the most part, it's been more kind of implicit in the way that we've all done business as lawyers and scholars and uh, you know business people, managers, uh, and so on. Um, which I think is true not only for antitrust law and price questions, but for lots of areas of, of life as a whole. Uh, we have time for maybe one last question or comment. Anything else? Well, so, oh, Wesley. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm not as expert as right here. I'm just a law student, but uh, I was wondering like if there's uh, any, I understand a little bit about like algorithm you can, um, they understand numbers they understand you know it's more uh, a model base uh, is there any i would say like like will you say like harm to consumers when the court is reasoning to say this algorithm you know this uh, could consider a uh, harm for consumer is there any way to quantify that and maybe limit that in, in the you know algorithm is that yeah right i mean i think thank you this is a very good question and i would say that um, um, quantifying uh, is relatively similar to what we do with curtails, with human created curtails. So what we do is we um, compare the price to the price that would have existed absent the anti-competitive conduct. So assuming that we can define what anti-competitive conduct is in the context of algorithmic coordination, because right now it's not prohibited, Okay, at least in the in the fourth case that I was talking about, the, the more, most difficult case, then um, uh, it might be very difficult to um, show what the benchmark is. But you can always compare it to a market without algorithms, without the use of algorithms, like they did in the European study of of gas stations. Okay, Aside, what happened okay. before they used? Okay, in Germany, what ha what happened before they used algorithms and afterwards, and they actually okay. showed that was a difference, and that affects, of course, consumer welfare. Gotcha. Thank you. Great. So I think we've come to the to the top of the hour, which formally brings us to a conclusion. I just want to close with the observation that as you've been talking since the beginning of your presentation, I've had in mind the online auctions for uh, advertising on websites. Uh, which I don't know that that's those have been you know challenged or litigated. Uh, in, in perhaps you, you're nodding. Yes, they have. Uh, but it's a it's a kind of it's you know automated advertising online. Uh, you know, it's the product of massive investments in algorithms in a way that is almost completely non-transparent to uh, consumers uh, visiting all kinds of websites. Right. So the advertisements that show up when you go to CNN or uh, any other business website, you know, you get all kinds of advertisements that are often custom tailored to you and your own surfing and browsing histories and personal preferences and what you bought on Amazon and all kinds of things which dictate um, 
you know, what you're seeing, in, and there's all kinds of automated systems going on in the background that generate that in right. uh, very complicated ways. And so I just, I have this image of like an entirely automated, like information experience, not just the shopping experience, uh, that's extremely troubling, right, in terms of our kind of classic models of like human driven choices about what to what to buy, what to read, what to watch, and all of a sudden, all of our Op options and so forth are being shaped in all kinds of um, hidden algorithmic ways. So I think your projects are super important and timely. And uh, I think we're all really looking forward to where you go next. So I'm going to have to sign off and so formally bring this to a close. Um, Brian, if you want to cut the recording, I want to thank our speaker, Mikhail Gal, for being here. I'm going to thank everybody else who came today to listen 